And we are back. Now, the irony in this is we've had podcasts all over the world. And as soon as you're on home soil, we can't seem to find a time that aligns. But here we are. We're back together no, again. No, right? <laughs> I know. Crazy craziness. How are you holding up? I'm good, mate. How are you doing? All the better for seeing you, my friend. Now, good. interesting card tonight. So as we were talking off camera, we've had yep. a couple of last minute switcheroos with the COVID scenario. We have. Anthony Lionheart Smith, long-winded um, nickname, but here we are current stock of anthony smith in your in your words and your where do you think he's at do you think this is a good fight for him do you think it's a sort of filler fight do you think he deserves high level competition now where do you think he's at um i think he's obviously struggled in his last couple of fights you know coming off the jones loss and then losing quite bad to glover to as well you know he just he just didn't look like the same anthony smith before the jones fight and when he was on his way up he was kind of you know, tearing through people and going in there and, you know, really putting hurt on people and, and stuff like that. And then after the Jones fight, <clears throat> you know, he, he said after the fight that he'd, he didn't fight the way he should. But that's what a lot of people say with Jones. You know, they, they always say, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to put it on him and don't let, don't let him back me up and work his, like, range in his game. I'm going to get in his face and, and, and do this and that. And then, you know, everybody that fights Jones just never seems to be able to do that. But that just shows you how good Jones is. You know, you go in with a game plan and you just can't pull the trigger and, and, and execute that game plan because Jones is he's that good and he's that good with the range and stuff. So I think that I think that really sort of damaged him um, mentally more than anything, just because he'd been going forward and he, you know, he'd been throwing bombs like he likes to and pushing the pace on people and he just he was just on the back foot for the whole of the, the sort of Jones fight. And then same sort of thing with Glover Tashira. I just don't think he really turned up to that fight. Don't get me wrong, Glover's, you know, he's in amazing form at the minute. I think he's, you know, last five fights, I think he's stopped four of them and all of them have been sort of top five, you know, opponents. So you, you can't take the win away from Glover, but I just don't think it was the same Anthony Smith going into that fight. Um, so I think this is probably a good fight. You know, he's, he's fighting a guy, is Devon Clark. Mm. Um, and, you know, he's not the biggest name, um, especially in the division. He's not the biggest name in the UFC. Um, I'm not actually sure where he's ranked. Do you know where he's ranked? Oh, is he even ranked? <laughs> is he? Probably, probably, yeah. If he is, he's obviously around the 15 mark. I know he's quite low down, sort of, if he is ranked. But, um, yeah, that's even if he is ranked. Um, so I think this is probably, you know, it's probably a good fight for Franny Smith. You know, he's still, he's obviously still up there in the, you know, in the top 10, probably still top five. I'm not actually sure where he's ranked at the moment, but he, he's still definitely up there. Even, you know, he's lost to Jones and, and Glover to Shearer, but, you know, that's not going to make his stock drop in the rankings that much because, you know, they're two, you know, world-class top-level fighters. Um, but yeah, yeah, taking this fight, you know, it is, it is a bit of a, a kind of a lose, not a lose-lose because he needs to build his confidence back up and get back on, onto winning ways for himself. But as far as the rankings and things goes, it's kind of a loose fight. Um, especially if he is, you know, Clark's definitely, like if he's not in the top 15. Um, but I think it's a good fight for him, you know, personally. Um, I think it'd be a tough one still because, you know, Clark's now going in there and seeing that Andy Smith hasn't performed in his last couple of fights. So he's probably thinking, well, I can take this scalp and, you know, an ex-title challenger and, and push myself forward. So he's going to go in there all guns blazing. So hopefully Anthony can get it done um, and, yeah, push his way back up there in the rankings. If he, if, he's get his, if he gets his head straight, I think that was the, uh, the main thing coming off that Jones loss um, was, was his head more than anything. So what do you think about that? I mean, the thing with losing to Jones, I mean, albeit take away the fact that he is who he is, when you're mm -hmm. that sort of mindset of I'm going to be number one, I'm going to be the best, I'm this, that and the other, when you get the opportunity to be number one, to take out the guy who's on top, and you come up short in that kind of fashion as well. It's that kind of reality check of, okay, what am I doing this for? If I want to be number one, and I've just yeah. been this far, so far away in front of this many people. It, again, it's confidence, everything else you believe. Because as much as you could say it's delusion, this, that, and the other, you believe what you believe. But when you get that kind of <laughs> evidence, so to speak, to say you're not there yet, it is a real test yeah. to see how it gets on. And then Clover to share again, he's just an extra sort of step back after that. So, yes, it's all very interesting. He lost some teeth. Yes, it's all very cool how tough he is, but toughness is a bit of a backhand of compliment to an extent. It's like, oh, you can take a good beating. That's a respectable thing, I think. And it's just to yeah, be... Yeah, not the best. 
Yeah, I agree. Not always the best thing. Definitely not. <clears throat> now, before we get to the rest of the card, there's one name on this. It's, I don't know. I don't want to be this guy, but Rachel Ostovich. Ah. So, <laughs> four and five. I mean, <laughs> I've seen, I don't know. It, this is an interesting conversation, isn't it? Marketability versus ability and everything else. And yes, you know, yeah. she is on that level, but when it comes to records like that, I know records are for DJs, this, that, and the other, but oof. Where do you sit on that? Because I, I still feel a bit like, okay, it's very marked. She's very well marketed, for lack of a better choice of words. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, talking of this fight, I actually saw a meme earlier. And obviously, you know, it's not the most stacked card. But then it said, you know, how can you say this card's not stacked? And it had a picture of, you know, racial, you know, in a bikini at the way in with her opponent, um, Gina... Manzari, um, you know, both next to each other in bikinis, and he was like, Yeah, that looks pretty stacked to me. <laughs> but it's wrong reasons, it's exactly what you're just saying. You know, her record is four and five now. You know, again, records are for DJs, um, but it's, it's a tough one. You know, the UFC are obviously are using her as for her marketability rather than her fighting ability, so it seems with the record. But she can fight. You know, it's not like she can't fight. It's just, you know, she's she's just not winning the way you would expect a UFC fighter to progress and win, if that makes sense. Um, and it's not like she's fighting the world, like, you know, the number one in the division every single week as well. So she is losing and she's losing to people that are, you know, lower down, lower down the rankings. I don't actually know what her record is, as in how many in a row she's won or lost at the moment. Um, you know, she's four and five, but... You know they've got to spice. You got to you got to do something to spice up the bottom of this card. So to speak. Uh, and, and like you say, yeah, it's it's not the uh, it's not the most stacked card. So p- popping them two in there uh, gives it a little flavour. I mean, again, it's this whole thing about you know, <coughs> it's got conversations and this. Uh, there's always a place for it. But anyway, yeah. we'll, we'll get off that thin ice and we'll go to the next topic <laughs> here. We'll do a bit of recapping. So obviously, I always butcher his name, uh, Figueredo and um, Alex Perez. Yep. I mean, have you seen the, the fight? Have you seen the finish? I have seen the fight. I have seen the finish. Absolutely um, magic. It was just... Oh. Oh, brilliant. D- to be honest, it was an abs- stunning finish. Absolutely brilliant. Great jiu-jitsu. Just, you know, Figueroa. He- he's just a-, a fucking... An absolute monster in every area of the game. It's just... You, you know, I don't, I don't really know what else to say. How would you think you'd do against, you know, Triple C? If, if the Henry Cejudo came back, huh? how do you think that match would go now? Triple cringe, bend the knee. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, really, because I think the fact triple cringe is, you know, entertaining the idea and this, that, and the other, I think he's confident in himself that I felt if he doubted his ability, he wouldn't even like, acknowledge it. He wouldn't even entertain the conversation. Mm. So that in itself, because again, the, th- the thing with... um. MMA as a whole, we need to be very careful with his recency bias. As good as someone is on a card that's happened a week ago or two weeks ago, the people who are also on that level may not have the spotlight, but they are still on that level as well. So again, yeah, you, get, you get a fancy finish of a couple of sequences. You can't sleep on Triple C, bend the knee. As much as I don't like him, <laughs> you got to respect what he's done. So I'd yeah, like okay. to think um, Henry Cejudo would, um, would win that. What do you think on that? I don't know. Um, it's obviously it's going to be a hard fight, you know. Figure it out, you know. In every aspect of MMA, he's he's a beast. You know, he hits harder than anybody else in that division. Um, that's that's just fact. Now he just hits so hard for for a flyweight guy, um, and you know his jujitsu skills are just unbelievable. The way he transitioned to that guillotine was just you know beautiful, and you know I, I thought he was out, you know. It, it looked like his neck was fully out, and but obviously the pressure that he puts on with that squeeze, how strong he is for that weight class, you know, obviously must have been must have been a lot of pressure because Alex Perez, you know, he's he's not someone who's going to give up easy. You know, I personally was a little bit disappointed, you know, as much as the, the fight was amazing for for you know those few minutes, I was obviously disappointed because I really wanted to see a war. I wanted to see Alex Perez, you know, put it on. 
figure out and him come back and you know back and forth and I wanted to see the whole you know 25 minute war um but obviously yeah we ended up with a, an absolute amazing submission and a great um fight on the night but coming back to the Henry Cejudo now he's just on a different level to you know he well he was on a different level to everybody in that division when he was fighting you know he's had a bit of time off now but you know his level's not going to change that much to be honest um, with the amount of time he's had off it's just like even if he was still the champion he'd only be fighting maybe now and then you know later on next year anyway so he only has one or two fights a year so it's not like he's had a a massive amount of time off and I'm, I'm pretty sure he's still in the gym training the same as he would have been whether he's fighting for a championship or not. Um, I just think the wrestling credentials of Henry Cejudo would be the, 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 the turning point. Um, you know, he's got great hands as well and he's got power. Obviously, we've seen him, you know, put away TJ Dillashaw and, you know, and, and hurt other people on, on the hat with the hands now as well. And he has, he's, I'm sure he was um, a Golden Gloves uh, boxing champion as well in his younger years before he went to the actual Olympics um, or I heard a, or something like that um, and he, he obviously works a lot on his striking so you know Figueroa's got the power but Henry Cejudo has got some some quick hands and he's obviously got a bit of power himself but that wrestling is the big turning point and <clears throat> when Henry Cejudo wants to use that wrestling there's not many that can can deal with it defensively um, just because he, he's just such a beast in, in the wrestling area. And definitely, Effie puts it together really nicely because this is this whole conversation yes. about applying <coughs> these skills in MMA instead of just having the skills. Because we're in good shooting doubles and strict wrestling, but if you can do it whilst taking pressure, make sure the range is the same, it's very it's different skill in itself. Now, this car had a bit of controversy on it. So, Mr. Raw Dog himself, Mr. Mike Perry, there's a lot of controversy in this. So, there he is. He's missed weight by was it five pounds or something like this. And he's just so disrespectful and he's still allowed to fight what is going on with that yeah. talk to me I don't know man I don't know where the guy's head's at at the minute you know he's missing weight he's uh, you know did he, did he I, I didn't actually watch this fight uh, did he still have just his, his girlfriend pregnant girlfriend in the corner or was there other people in the corner this time I believe so I'm not too sure to see it either. Just, it's just one of these it's the, the disrespect because it's yeah. just like you know Who's that for? Who's him missing weight for? Is he trying to show he can get away with it? Is he trying to show he doesn't care? What's he trying to show? The fact the fight went across, went us ahead anyway. I mean, the fact mm. it means one is, you know, <coughs> saves a bit of, you know, <laughs> insult or injury. But even still, like, what does this mean now? Just the lack of respect for the organisation. I, I don't understand it. Yeah, I just, I don't, like I say, I just don't know where his head's at. You know, he's just, he's, he's kind of on a really slippery slope at the minute. You know, he's been trouble in trouble with the police for, you know, out of octagon things. You know, he, he got into a, a bar fight with a, with a few guys and, you know, he was really drunk. And, you know, the videos going around the internet and stuff. And then obviously, you know, the, the, the craziness with his corner team and getting rid of everybody and just having his girlfriend in the corner. And then obviously now, you know, not even really bothering, just saying before, like, in interviews before, yeah, I'm well overweight. I don't think I'm going to make it. I don't really care, sort of thing. It's just just complete disrespect at the moment. So, yeah, I don't know what the UFC are going to do about this because I know when he got into the, the, the kind of bar fight, they made him go to, you know, see somebody and, you know, talk to somebody about his, you know, anger issues, his, his sort of alcohol um, usage away from the UFC. Um, so, just being so disrespectful as well. It's just kind of a bit of a, you know, you know spit in the face type thing, um, doing this to the UFC after they've already tried to help him. Um, so I don't really know where he goes from here, Mike Perry. You know, he's talking about maybe going up to 185 rather than 170, um, which is awesome because then Till can actually fight him. Um, but as far as his, um, his, his standing with the UFC, I don't know where he's going to go from here. Well, moving on sort from that, the Shevchenko yeah. sisters. Now, phenomenal performances from both. Now, yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm going to butcher her name. Antonina? Or was it Antonina? Oh, yeah. Antonina, yeah. Absolutely phenomenal still. Again, very clinical performance. And her grappling looks slick as well. That's where it gets tricky. Because, yeah. again, when it comes to someone who's predominantly known as a striker, that kind of grappling, it shouldn't get slept on still. And no. Wow. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, Joaquin Buckley as well on this card. 
So yep. obviously Joaquin, for people who aren't familiar with his name, only the KO might have seen against Impica Sanganai. The sort of yep. kick, kick got caught and then he did the turning psychic and now he's Mr. Worldwide. Now, this was a horrible, horrible, horrible finish. Did you see this fight? No, I missed this one, unfortunately. So this was where the corner needed to step in. So first round, saved by the bell. Jordan Wright looked hurt. He looked defeated. He looked in a bad place. He then went out and no sort of miraculous film comeback. He just took more punishment and got stopped. And yeah. it's one of those where like, you got, I don't know. Because if you get these kind of last minute clips and you saved your saved the fight and there you are, but when you don't, you don't. And even if you do, you're sort of taking out extra damage. It's just a bit of a tricky one. Yeah. You also have um, Nicholas Dolby and Danny, yeah. Rod- Danny Rodriguez. Now, this was an interesting one because obviously Dolby, he's between cage rules and UFC quite a lot. He's a bit between there again. Not quite Craig White anymore because he's, you know, more of a staple in the UFC. Yeah. And this, this fight was interesting the way he could sort of apply his sort of style because, again, he's got quite a, a wide sort of taekwondo sort of style-esque. Yep. But I was mixing it up quite nicely. And it was interesting how he could sort of secure the rounds as such because, again, it was could have gone either way, but no, he fought quite intelligently. And yeah, I'm sort of jumping around fights here. Did you catch most of this card? Uh, I caught... Where were you? I'm, I'm, I actually missed most of the prelims. I watched a few of the highlights and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously caught the, the, the main fights in the in the uh, main event. Cool. Do you want to take us through the main card then? Have you seen um, Mauricio Shogun Hua and um, Paul Berge Craig? Yes. Paul Craig. Yeah, good fight. Um, Mauricio Shogun Hua is, is another one. I just, I, I think, you know, I haven't watched any interviews afterwards, but I'm sure Dana White's probably mentioned that he should maybe think about hanging his gloves up now. He, uh, he definitely was, was not the, the Shogun of, of old. Um, he looked very slow. You know, he's, he's getting on a bit. You know, he can still fight. Obviously, he can still fight. You know, he's still got the skills. He's just not got the, the sort of, I don't know, I, I don't even know what the word is, but he just can't put it into practice anymore as the way he used to, obviously. He can't take the punishment he used to. And um, yeah, Paul Craig had a great fight, and obviously it was there. It was a, it was a rematch from the first one mm. um, that he took on. I think it was maybe two weeks' notice before, and he was saying that he, he wanted a better fight camp and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, this one he looked great. He actually looked really, really good. Um, <clears> Hurt <throat> Shogun with some nice body kicks. You know, teeps up the middle. Um, both landed decent shots standing, but, but Paul Craig did really well. But he, he took him down, and that was the difference in the first fight. Is you know, he didn't have the extra bit of gas tank or the extra bit of sort of pulling his arms to, to you know, finish takedowns against Shogun, whereas this one he did. And, you know, he just dominated him on the floor. And, you know, great, great finish. Took his back, um, you know, in the second round, flattened him out. And, uh, yeah, yeah, finished him with strikes. Didn't he actually even need to go for the submission that we know, obviously, you know, um, he's, he's known for being a, being a top-level grappler. But, yeah, he just finished him with strikes. It was a great finish. Um, so yeah, looking forward to where he goes from here. Obviously, now he's had the the sort of like the two fights with Shogun. It's kind of that's finished now, and and uh, so it'll be nice to see who he gets next opponent wise, uh, where he goes. Obviously, he's looking to you know go up that ladder now. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. You know, it's a good fight, good finish. Uh, what about did you get to see that one? No, I've got quite a few sort of fights in this card, and again, this one was a bit of a it's interesting one when it comes to. Um, Shogun and these sort of returning legends as such it was given that light of seeing the, the, <laughs> the highlights from X amount of years ago and it looks so glamorous so exciting and again I'm a huge fan of Shogun he's one of the first MMA fighters I've ever seen yeah and same even since like the Jones sort of <laughs> lost in the first place you sort of think okay where does he go from there and that's I don't know how many years ago now so yeah. it makes you want them to go before you have to want them to leave as such you see what I mean yeah and moving on first to the car, we've got Caitlin Shikagian against um, Stephanie yes. Cavallio. Now, Caitlin Shikagian, she's an interesting one. So, again, she came off a loss to... Um, who was it she fought for the title? Was it Holly Holm she fought? Who was it? Uh, she fought for Shevchenko? No, Shevchenko, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And she didn't look yeah. bad there. She looked out of place. And, again, yep. she, she's sure. stepping up still. Yeah. And Stephanie Cavallio, she's a veteran as well. I mean, yeah. in the female divisions... She definitely stands out as one of the best. And now we talk about the best. We've got to talk about Valentina Shevchenko. But she is unreal. And Jennifer she, Meyer, 
I mean, she didn't look out of place either, to be fair. He managed no. to win around as well. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, great fight. You know, Shevchenko, Shevchenko. She has been out injured. Um, and afterwards, she said in an interview that she was really happy that she got the full five rounds rather than getting a finish um, because she just wanted to know where, where she was body-wise and stuff. Um, and like you say, Jennifer Meyer, you know, she was kind of a no, but nobody. You know, nobody really knew who she was. She obviously won a couple of fights and lost a couple of fights in the UFC uh, and then fought Jojo Calderwood, who mm. was meant to be next in line for the title. She obviously, you know, got that awesome arm bar on against Jojo and um, and then said sort of thing, you know, I beat the person that was supposed to get the next title fight. I want the title fight. And she got it. Um, and it was, and, and she did not look out of place at all. And like you say, she did. She won a round. Um, it was first or second round. You know, Shevchenko is still sort of getting through the gears. But then <clears throat> Shevchenko, she used a very grapple heavy sort of um, um game plan in the first few rounds, um, which was quite surprising. Um, obviously, you know, Joe Rogan and the guys were talking about it and they were quite surprised, you know, being, like we said, you know, she's like ex, you know, 10-time world champion in Muay Thai and before she came into MMA. So you'd expect her just to stick to the, the Muay Thai. But like, like you said about her sister earlier, you know, they're both really, really slick, you know, grapplers as well as strikers. So she, she did a very sort of wrestle-heavy game plan for the first few rounds. And I think that was more uh, as, a, as an actual strategic game plan to tire Maya out because you know, Maya is a, she's a big woman for the, for the weight class and she has missed weight a couple of times. So I think the cut in Shevchenko's mind, the cut was going to be obviously a big cut. Um, so first few rounds, she thought she'd be kind of heavy on her and use the wrestling to tire her out a little bit. And then, you know, fourth and fifth round, she just took over with a strike in just absolutely, you know, Shevchenko, the way she is, the bullet. She was absolutely pinpoint with a striking and and just some beautiful, beautiful combos and stuff coming together. Um, it was a great fight. But you know, again, Maya, you know, she did not look out of place. She looked great. She looked great at the weight. It's the best I've seen her looking. Um, she does come in a little bit heavy normally in in, in the you know in the fights. Um, I think she cuts a bit more weight before, but I think obviously with this one being a being a title fight, she you know did the extra things that she needed to do diet wise and maybe strength and conditioning wise and got the weight off better this time. Um, she looked great and she's going to be one. I think she'll maybe challenge again in the future. You know she'll go back now. She'll hopefully win a couple more fights and maybe challenge again in the future because you know she's definitely one to look out for because she's got she had great boxing especially in the pocket, great boxing in the pocket and she's got good jiu jitsu as well. So yeah, good all round fight. But Shevchenko's the bullet and she's. You know, I don't see anybody beating her at the moment at that weight. Now, with that as well, title fights, this is something I've brought up before and I'll keep bringing up again. The champion <clears> shouldn't <throat> have to make weight to the same, like, strict sort of restrictions, I feel. I feel the champion should be the one allowed an allowance. I don't understand why you're allowed an allowance up until a title fight. Because surely by that point, you've proved you can make the weight. You've proved you own that weight. Obviously, like, you know, it's not like Mike Perry allowance or like five pounds, but like, you know, a pound either side, just like, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought it'd be unreasonable, but it's to say, it's either, I, th- I don't know. It's, just, it's a tricky one. Where do you sit on that? I, I can't help but feel that you've proven you can make the weight and you don't need to prove it again being the champion. Or do you feel the champion should hold up a certain standard? No, yeah. Um, I see where you're coming from, but I definitely think that the champion should obviously still make the, the weight bang on, on the, you know, your 145, 155, whatever the weight class is, they have to be on the money sort of thing. Um, just to, to show, like you said, they are the champion, you know, you know, prove that they can, they can make the weight, they can, you know, perform at that weight rather than the extra pound. You know, we say a pound and, and people listening that, that have never cut weight and made weight before, they think one pound, that's, that's nothing. I can, I can go and have a shit and, you know, shit out a pound, no problem, it's easy, but... <laughs> when you when you've been dieting for ten weeks and and you you, you you've been water loading and your body's at, at the edge of it can be when it comes to cutting weight and stuff like that that one pound's a massive difference. So I think the champion should still have to make that championship weight um, just to show how professional they are and you know prove that they are the champ and it's it's the, their weight class and not not one pound extra sort of thing. That's just the way I feel about it. Definitely makes sense. There's definitely a case for both sides. Now, yeah, definitely. Without going too far back, we'll, we'll sort of cover the um, Felder um, RDA card. Just run yep. it back because we've missed a couple of weeks. So I've caught up on the entire card. Now, a couple of shout-outs on this. So we've got Corey McKenna, 
making a UFC yeah. debut. Absolutely phenomenal. Really nice combinations. And again, this is a huge step up for her in competition. And she didn't look out of place. She looked great. Got the decision win. Sean Strickland, he fought on Halloween. Two weeks afterwards, he's here. Phenomenal KO. Now, Sean Strickland, if you watch his fight against Jack Marshman on the Halloween card, it was so funny. You just hear him just chatting. Not even chatting shit and stuff. Just sort of egging him on this, that, and the other. And it was good to see him still bring that. Not, he didn't say a lot this time around. He wasn't doing the same kind of... I don't know. It was a different sort of fight. Sorry, mate. Episode. Just lost you a little minute. No problem there. I was catching up in the um, RDA Felder card. Gone over the McKenna Hansen fight. Gone That's over it. the um, Strickland Allen fight. Now I'm about to go on to Ashley Yoda, um, Miranda Granger. And again, this was interesting. So Ashley Yoda again. This was a really interesting back and forth. And I believe is it Yoda who's got the judo background? Is it Miranda? And it was really interesting hearing, not hearing, seeing how the application. Because again, you get the hip throws and the follow ups and everything else. Yeah. No. Ashley Yoda looked phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. But the f- thing that stood out for me in this card is Cannon Williams. These are the chaos's name. It was a terrifying knockout. I think it was just a one punch cross hook, and that was it. Done. Flatlined. Seeing a man that flatlined is terrifying. Yes. And then obviously the main event. So did you catch him, um, Felder Radio? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I caught the main event. I caught one or two of the fights on that. I haven't seen all of them yet. Um, just want to go back to the Corey McKenna. I know, obviously, young, yeah, Great Britain, you know, pushing it for England and stuff like that. Um, how did you actually see the fight? How did you score it yourself? Well, that the bias, I didn't really see much in it. I could have seen it go either way. Okay. I did, I did, they had this conversation in the gym earlier that yeah. with striking, unless you're really beating someone up, it's quite hard to really score it. Like convincingly, so you need to take these takedowns to get staples. And yeah. seeing Corey getting taken down, it didn't really help on that side of things. So again, there's the sides for both, but mm, where do you see it? What did you score that? I I haven't sat down and scored it properly, and sometimes I do that with these type of fights. Is I'll actually sit there and I'll, I'll turn the commentary off as well, because obviously the commentary can be quite biased. You know which way they're sort of seeing it themselves as well. Uh, and I'll get a pen and paper and I'll score it like I would do if I was actually judging a fight. Um, I haven't actually done it with this one, but when I first watched it, I actually thought it went the other way. Um, I thought it was Kay Hansen that, that had won the fight. And like you say, it was quite close with the striking. I think Hansen was maybe throwing a bit more volume, but McKenna was landing maybe some better shots um, for what I can remember of the fight. Um, but yeah, I kind of give it Hanson just because she got the few takedowns. So just with her mixing it up just that little bit, I just kind of thought it gave her the edge in one or two of the rounds. Um, but it was a really close fight. Like you say, it, it probably could have gone either way. I just wondered what, how you kind of, how you saw it yourself. So again, there's always the bias because again, the sort of home front and again, friends with yeah, her, her partners wrong. again, there's always going to be that kind of thing. So yeah, it was strange because I saw the result before I watched the fight. So it's an interesting one to see how this then would have been brought back round. Because in the takedowns are always a bit of an alarm bell. Okay, yeah, she might be winning the striking, but being on the bottom, again, we say the floor is lava, the wall is lava. And every time you're spending there is time against you of control time through the person. And whether or not you're striking and landing, that's, that's always amplif- amplify the sort of finishing you're getting, the scoring you're getting. But ultimately, it's still passively ticking along. You're in a negative yep. position. So it's, it's always that kind of situation. Now, Felder RDA. Oh, what a fight. It was. And I mean, what was interesting was RDA's wall wrestling, which I really liked a lot. Because it's one of those elements that was really underappreciated in the sport. And again, Mm -hmm. not even just from laymen, from people who compete as well. It's not overly exciting to watch. Oh, 100% I agree with you there. But the art of it, the intricacies, the weight distribution, the level changing, everything. And the application, the MMA wrestling. Because again, this is five rounds. And RDA fought like it was five rounds. He wasn't hunting for a finish within like a couple of minutes, like it's a sub only match. He didn't try and like put Felder away too urgently. Yeah. They kept the pace on, kept the pressure on, and Felder, Felder held up. And afterwards, hearing Felder say how it sort of gave him that kick up the ass to really want to do it again, he got excited about it. He, he wants to be there. Yeah. That's so refreshing to hear. What were your thoughts on the fight? I thought it was a great fight. Really, really good fight. Um, exactly what you just said. I loved the way RDA approached the fight with the cage wrestling. 
um, the game plan of putting him up against the face, uh, fence, using the head position, you know, like you say, the, the different changes in levels up against the fence. Uh, I'm a big fan of that because that was very sort of my sort of style. Just just make it dirty, make it grindy, sort of like a Randy Couture-esque sort of style of fight, you know, dirty boxing, changing levels, using the fence, using my head position. Um, and it's exactly what RDA did and it was great. Um, but I, on the flip side as well, I love the way Felder fought as well. And he looked sharper than I think I've ever seen him. And, you know, we spoke quite a lot about, you know, he's taking it on, you know, four days notice and all stuff like that. And then obviously we did find out that he was training for a triathlon. So he did kind of have some kind of base fitness. Um, but, you know, afterwards talking to him, hearing that, you know, yeah, he was training for a triathlon and he was still doing some striking. Um, but he'd not wrestled for like two months, I think it was, before the fight. Um, and I think RDA, you know, was perfect game plan for him is, you know, put him, we know Felder, you know, he's predominantly a striker. You know, he's got, he's got good wrestling. And when he's training, it obviously it's a bit sharper than what it was in this fight. Uh, but I think it was a perfect game plan for RDA to come in and, and use that, you know, war wrestling and, and, and grind him out a little bit more and, Try and stay away from the striking, but yeah, Felder was brilliant, and the fact, like you just said, that he kind of lit a bit of a fire up his ass, um, under his ass, should I say? It is brilliant because I was, I was, I was actually really good after his last fight, and he kind of was like hinting that you know he, he was kind of done and he kind of lost love for it, and you know he was thinking about retiring and stuff because I love watching Felder. You know, he is one of my favourite fighters in the UFC, and I, I think he's doing a great job, uh, commentating wise. But I, th I still think he's got, you know, a good couple of years and, and a good couple of, you know, really good, interesting fights for him in that division still. So I'm happy that he's, uh, he's come out of this and he's, he's, he's got a bit of a, you know, be in his bonnet and he wants to get back to sort of around the top sort of the division again. So I think it's great. Uh, and then coming out of this, um, RDA-wise, where do you see him going from here? I know he always is obviously called out Conor McGregor. Um, I think that's just his oh, way of, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think that's just his way of trying to get to the title before everybody else in the division type thing. Um, he did make kind of a good point that, you know, him and Conor McGregor, the only two full champions and everybody else in the division were only sort of interim title champions. Um, so he does have a little bit of a point, but, you know, I, I do think there's other people sort of ahead of him in the, in the title race at the moment. What do you think? Again, the rankings listing is fairly arbitrary. It's all kind of all over the place. Yes. But he's building a case for himself. And I tell you who would be good for him after he has his fight is um a dark horse, Charles Oliveira. Because yeah. another person who's at that level without the sort of the marketing, without the same kind of level of respect and acknowledgement. So yeah. despite having that kind of thing, because when you have that conversation saying they should fight each other, no one thinks, oh no, he's not on the same like, you know, business level sort of thing in the sense of marketing this that and the other yep. even though he skill wise this that and the other he is in the same conversation so again this is where the ambiguity comes from this is how he can really sort of play in his sort of strengths yes it's a hardest fight of the lot i'd imagine i think out of everyone in this lightweight conversation the dark horse for a reason he is exactly <laughs> he's everyone's worst nightmare he's, a, he's the worst 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 of worst case scenarios he's yeah. on the lower profile with the highest risk so I think that'd be a perfect fight for him to not necessarily own respect as such, but I feel it's the one for him to really not show his stripes. You see what I mean? He's there. But what do you think? You're number six guy as well. They're both number Who's six. That? Uh, Charles Oliveira's number six as well. They're both joint numbers. Yeah, Dardier is number seven and Charles Oliveira is number six. Well, I didn't even realise that until um, after I said that. Okay, okay. So who who's the top five right now? What have they got it down as? Well, outside of um, Khabib, we've got Gaethje number one, Poirier number two, Fergie number three, McNugget number four, Hooker number five, and Oliveira six. Okay, okay, cool. So yeah, you got Hooker in there as well. Yeah, do you know what? That's just a, it's such a good division right now, with lightweight. And then obviously you've got Chandler coming in as well. You know, I don't know who Chandler's going to fight next. Um, it's such a it's such a good division. We I think now with Khabib stepping away, or has he stepped away? I don't know. Keep seeing memes and seeing pictures and things of you know him and Dana maybe thinking about him coming back and trying to get that thirty and zero rather than twenty nine and zero. But without him taking him out of the equation, 
it's such an open division right now, but with such great fights to make. Like you say, you've got RDA dropping back down, former champion. And he, he looked great, like body-wise. He looked better than he ever has before. Um, obviously, you've got McGregor now fighting um, Justin Poirier, you know, for their, for their round two. Um, so that's, a, that's another big one to come back, obviously, McGregor coming back. Then you've got Chandler coming in, you know, somebody he's, he's never fought in the UFC, but we know his credentials over in Bellator and see if he can bring him across. You know, Eddie Alvarez did amazing when he came over and obviously won the title from Bellator. And I see if, if, if Chandler can do the same sort of thing. And then, like you say, you've got Hooker, you've got uh, Ferguson and obviously Aloe Vera now about to fight as well, which I think is a, a great fight. So, you know, in that top sort of like, what's that, six, six or seven people, you know, there's some amazing fights to be made. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see who they actually put with Chandler um, and the fact that you've just mentioned Hooker and you know he hasn't fought for a while and he hasn't got a fight coming up that might be a possibility maybe Chandler and Hooker because um, everybody else is pretty much sort of matched up at the moment so it's going to be interesting it's, gonna be, it's, it's interesting but it's a good interesting the lightweight division at the minute it's, it's on fire man I, I, I really like what I'm seeing 100% as well and on the topic of um rankings and divisions interestingly enough so we've got Edwards and Shemaev in December we talk about number disparity so Leon is number three and Hamzat's number 15 I mean when it comes to these sort of numbers anyway I mean if I said they're arbitrary I mean they're really arbitrary at this sort of point and how they can do these matchups how they can do all this sort of stuff it I don't know yeah. it's, it's a funny one I lose a lot of respect for that kind of side of things and integrity and this is why I don't want Khabib to come back because then it, it taints his legacy as such, I feel. I feel him being who he is and having his word and being respected. He said, this is it. I've had my moment. I've had my tears in the cage. This is it. I'm gone. If he comes back for a 30 no for a cash grab, for whatever reason, he give, excuse he gives it, I think that taints Khabib's record. I think it taints Khabib's character. What do you feel on that? Yeah, no, I hundred percent see where you come in, come in with this. Um, but again, they're gonna if he does come back, they're gonna spin it because his dad wanted him to go thirty and zero. Hmm. So, you know, like you say, you know, it kind of takes him a little bit where where he's, you know, like you say, he's had his tears in the cage, and you know, you know, he said goodbye and he's he's promised his mum that he'll he will never go into the cage again because his dad's not there anymore. But then obviously he's also, he can spin it where he's like, well, you know, I promised my mum, but I also promised my dad that I would get to 30 and 0 and then retire sort of thing. So I've got kind of one fight more to go. And, you know, so I think there's a possibility of him, of him coming back. But um, if he does, rather than getting back in the mix with the lightweight division, what about maybe a super fight with him in GSP? A one-off? Whatever weight they want to do. You know, I don't want, want that. I don't want that in the slightest. As much as it's, no. it sounds like fun, it's even more of a, a slate on Khabib sort of thing to go for a novelty sort of thing. Again, this goes against who could be his image, his persona, this sort of, you know, against number one bullshit, against all this kind of stuff. It's integrity versus... Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know. It's, 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 obviously, it's his world, his business, this, that, and the other, but in the same breath, yeah. I, I, I don't like it. I don't like that. And GSP coming back for that kind of fight... As much as it's all a bit of fun, like who would have won this, that, and the other, I don't want GSP to be the next Anderson Silva. I don't want him being like that, just being a bit like, okay, you're there just for these upcoming guys just to make a name out of you. Yeah. I can't I can't have that for my, my man GSP, the, my favourite fighter. <laughs> thing, yeah, but I can't have him going that way. I, uh, you don't like it at all. He speaks but, like um, a potato anyway. I don't want him to go like, you know, even worse. <laughs> but uh, the whole Khabib thing, you know, I don't think that will damage his legacy too much because, yeah, he's, you know, he, you know, we know him for this, like, number one bullshit and all that sort of stuff. But find somebody like GSP, that only makes him more of a GOAT, if that makes sense. You know, you know, the names that are up there with the GOAT status at the moment are obviously John Jones, Anderson Silva, GSP, you know, and, 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 and Mighty Mouse. You know, they're the, the four for me, really. Um, UFC wise, they're the four for me really that you could say are the goats. Um, you know, each one in different area eras, um, but they're the four for me that you know you would put 
into a into a hat to be the, the greatest of all time sort of thing. So and Khabib wants that as well. You know, he got his pound for pound. You know, he he got Danis to change the pound for pound, which I don't think's right personally. But he, he got him to change it, so he's he's got the pound for pound. But he also wants to be known as as you know as one of the goats, which I do think he is. But for me, those four are still above him at the moment. And for him to come back and fight GSP and to, if he beat the GSP, that automatically puts him up there as, as, as one of the GOATs. Again, these conversations, yeah. who'd win a fight, the thing or the Hulk or whoever this and the other, these, these, these ratings, these numbers, these conversations, they don't mean anything. No. <laughs> There's no, sure. there's no tangible things. It's all very much our, well, I think. Well, no, no, I yeah. think. It's just, I don't know. Again, same with legacy, same with all this kind of stuff. There's no tangible way of measuring this. But again, this is another open one, which we'd like to hear from you on Fisticuffs underscore podcast. Any questions, any things like that, fire them away on this sort of topic. Give us your opinions. Now, we'll look forward to next couple of events. So we've got exciting cage rose announcements. Yes. So if we look... So the first day of the trilogy on the 10th of December, we have Jack McGuire against Dan Neal Bantamweight, Michael Figler against Anthony O'Connor, Daryl Gorman against Nicholas LeBlanc, Flyweight, Emra Somers against Aidan Stephen Feather, Mehdi Ben Lakdar, Steve McIntosh, Lightweight, so Steve McIntosh, Wesley Meyer against Michelle Martiginoni, Martiginoni? Yeah, Bantamweight, Adam Rossinger, Sam Creasy, Flyweight, and the awesome. man himself, Luke Shanks, against Jake Hadley. Initial yep. thoughts. Awesome card. It's going to look amazing. Um, I'm a big fan of the trilogies anyway. Um, and, yeah, the, the cards are shaping up absolutely brilliant at the moment. There's some, there's some you know, there's, there's other big names to be added to that as well. Obviously, over the, over the next few weeks, coming up for the, uh, for the next two events. But, yeah, some great fights in there. And, you know... The the uh, Am Singer and, and Sam Creasy fight is I, I, it's still going to be one of my favourite fights. I can't wait to watch that fight. Yeah, so I've been training with um, Sam as well, and yeah, cool. seeing inspiring today. Just seeing him, he's just another level. Like yeah. the guy who's training with him, like these people who are very familiar with him, train with him fairly regularly, if not all the time, and they can't believe how much he's come on. And even in his modesty and his humility of saying, yeah, you know, I'm feeling a bit off, feeling a bit tired, this, that, never know. <laughs> he don't fucking look it. He's not, he's, he's, if he says he's off, he needs to start acting like it. Now, interesting fights in this. Obviously, the uh, Sam's last opponent on the last um, card, Nicholas LeBron, yeah. he's fighting Darren O'Gorman. Now, Darren O'Gorman, he's an interesting one. So the grappling there, the finishes, the, again, the, the names on this card, they don't give it enough sort of credit, the amount of respect they should have for all the fights they've had, the opponents they've faced, the level of opponents. So these fights, I can't see a dull card in this. So, you know, like Michael Figler, like he stopped um, Oban Elliott. That was a bit of a cringe, sort of back and forth, but that's not the conversation. <laughs> We've got um, Emra Summers against Aiden Steven. Aiden Steven again. Unfortunately, came up short against Paul Hughes, but he himself is a really high-level guy. And I'd love to see him get back in that featherweight title conversation. Mm -hmm. Ben Lakdar, he was one half of the fight of the year from last year against Joe McColgan. Mm -hmm. Wesley Meyer off a emphatic, terrifying finish of um, Adam Wilson. Again, these fights are exciting. And then Luke Shanks about to destroy yeah. Jake Hadley. I mean, Jake's probably a nice guy, but Luke Shanks is my guy. His level's growing and growing and growing. And I can't wait to see him get the belt again. And hopefully, he should go to the UFC. If he doesn't, it's an insult and it's a problem. Okay. Now, the second day of the trilogy, the 11th, we now have Nathan Fletcher, Lee Mitchell. This is the second time they're doing this because last time they tried it in the first trilogy, I think Nathan tested positive for COVID or one of his team did. We have okay. Ben Ellis, Kingsley Crawford, Feather, Tom Burns and Steve Aimble, 150-pound catchweight, Mickey Stano and the Latvian Express, Madras Familias, Adam Ventry and Decky McKaylin, McKaylin, uh, some, you know, you get just to it. <laughs> Liam Gittins against Josh Reed, Bantam White, very exciting fight. Matt Inman, Matt Bonner. I will get into that in a minute. Aaron Khalidi against Justin Ber Berlinson. And the champion fight for Natias Frederick against Jamie Richardson. So, where do we start with this card? Where do you want to go from it? Uh, mate, you, you take it away. You're, you're the, uh, the Cage Warriors fanboy, mate. You go for it. 
Exactly. So Nathan Fletcher, Lee Mitchell, these guys, yep. both prospects, both on the up, and these are the exciting ones because as much as their careers, you'd like to see them pad out with like the bums and the set and the other and then build up to each other later down the line. This is where people get tested a lot more. This is the fights you want to see. These are the fights you should be seeing. And this is an exciting one. Boys have biased towards Lee. I've had him on the podcast, trained with him, really sound guy. But be an exciting fight nonetheless. Um, not too familiar with Kingsley Crawford and Ben Ellis, I believe. I'll come back to that. Um, Tom Mearns and Steve Ambrose. So Steve comes off a loss against Jordan. Now, although having lost against Jordan, Steve looked good. He looked sharp. He looked like he's improving. And that's he did. Really, he's been making these changes from fight to fight. Yes, he's on three or four yeah. loss streak, but he's looking better each fight. And Tom Mearns, a similar situation. He came off a loss against Kieran Lister. But he didn't look out of place. He didn't look like a journeyman. Didn't like he was getting, you know, out class. No. Com- the decision could have gone either way. So for these two, they're both at a very similar crossroads where their career could go. And I think it's a really interesting sort of fight for both of them. Um, moving on, we've got Mickey Stano against Flavian Express. Now, Mickey Stano unfortunately came up short against Aaron Khalid and ended up getting, um, I think it was Darst or Anaconda in the first like, 30 seconds, went out cold. And it's a shame because Mickey Stano is one of these sort of fan favourites. He's just a bit of a geezer. We love him. And um, Latvian Express, I mean, despite being from Latvia, he's um, a Nottingham boy, so you probably, are you friendly with him? you trained with him? Uh, no, n- not too much, no. Yeah, he's been at four dimension, I believe. Yeah, he's a really yeah, um, yeah, yeah. good level guy. Can beat a lot. He's um, been on cage always quite a lot. So it'd be interesting yeah. seeing this because he came up short against, I can't think of who it was at the last cage always. Um, Adam Ventry, I believe Adam is he SBG Manchester or is he next gen Liverpool? I can't remember, but again, he's a very high level guy. I've seen him on quite a few of the cage warriors, so I'd be interested in seeing that one. Yeah. Now, Liam Gittins, I'm not too familiar with, but Josh Reed. If anyone hasn't seen Josh Reed and Nathaniel Wood, <laughs> you, you don't know MMA, you don't know. Oh my god, you, you're missing out. Whenever Cage Warriors do one of these like best fights, top ten fights, top fifteen, this that, and the other, that one's always number one. It's yeah. Paul Daly, um, uh, Nick Diaz kind of vibes. You need to <laughs> just back and forth chaos. Just um, a great fight. Oh, absolute chaos! And now Matt Emmon against Matt Bonner. So, a bit of background on this one. So Matt Emmon is one of the coaches at SBG Manchester, and his yep. student George Smith was it for Matt Bonner at the last Cage Warriors. So Matt has now come back to revenge his student, which is a bit, you know, film-esque, so a bit an interesting one. Yeah. Aaron Khalid again, it's, saying so, government. It's nice to see him back in the cage. You know, I, I always thought with Matt Inman that, you know, he, he's got the potential to go all the way. You know, he, he's got the level, and like I say, he's, he's one of the coaches at um, SPG, and, you know, he's always fought some great fights on Cage Warriors and stuff, and it was a, it was a shame that he kind of not retired, but, you know, sort of semi-retired and sort of hung his gloves up a little bit. So it's uh, it's nice to see him back in there. And, and maybe with this, he's got kind of the same sort of idea as Paul Felder and he gets this fight and, you know, he has a good fight and it kind of lights a bit of a like a little flame inside him and, and he pushes on a little bit because it'd be good to see him fight a little bit more regular. Well, this is a sort of conversation where if it's a novelty fight or he's back in action, it's some momentum. Because again, we take on that coaching role and that responsibility more often than not, that takes priority. Or it then cuts into a lot of time. You need to be training for your fight. So it depends on where this sort of goes. Now, it, fingers crossed that lives up to expectations. I'm looking forward to that one. And Natias Frederick, Jim Richardson, again, that was meant to happen on the last Cage Warriors. However, I think one of Natias's team came up with um, COVID, which yeah. I don't really understood because it's a bit of a shit one, but each their own. Yeah. So now we move on to the final day of the trilogy so far announced on the Sunday the 12th we have James Sheehan against Josh Plant very excited to see Josh Plant back in the cage Ian Gary Me too, 100%. Lawrence Tracy Joe McColgan Kieran yep. Lister Dean Truman Yassine Belhaj who um, fought Jack Grant Paul Hughes yep. Jordan Vichenek Jack Grant Aji Sardi Sardari and Morgan Sherrier against Pegram for the title Initial thoughts from yourself, yeah. my friend. Um, yeah, really looking forward to seeing Josh Plant back in the uh, back in the cage. Um, you know, I haven't spoke to him recently, 
Um, but I spoke to one or two of his teammates and, you know, he's training well and, and looking good in training. So looking really looking forward to that. I'm a big fan of Josh Plant and a, a good friend of his as well. So that's going to be awesome. Um, and then, yep, Dean Truman in there as well. Same sort of thing. I've not, I, we, we, we spoke a little bit, uh, not recently, um, but I, I know he's training hard. Um, you know, he's, he's been in and out of Nottingham MMA gym uh, on certain days. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's pro training only. So everybody's not allowed, obviously you're not allowed in there anyway. So it's, it's cordoned off for them. Um, but yeah, he's in and out. So I've not seen him or seen how he is because I'm not part of his his bubble team or whatever they want to call it at the moment bubble um, yeah <laughs> bubble buddies but um yeah i'm looking forward to seeing him getting back in there and moving up a weight as well you know um he's going to be a powerful 155er he's not going to be the biggest 155er but um he's very very powerful he's got very wide backs and, and quite long arms sort of like um, so it's going to be interesting now he's moving up to 155 rather than 145 and, and draining himself uh, as much as he used to. So it's going to be good. It's going to be a good, good couple of fights. So there's a lot of exciting fights in there. So again, we've got Joe, Col- Joe McColgan, Kieran Lister. So Joe McColgan came up short against, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Mason Jones before he went on to then fight. Good old love, Dr. Proctor. Then, you know, champ, champ. And Kieran Lister off a win off again against Tom Mearns, Kieran's black belt and BJJ. And again, he's one of these guys who sort of just gets on with it in the background, not so on for, you know, shouting about calling people out this, that, and the other. No, he's very sort of, you know, it's a very exciting fight. Dean Truman. Now, the guy who's against, he's the guy Jack Grant fought. People yeah. sort of refer to him as Crazy Legs just for a, <laughs> a sort of mouthful, I believe. So there'll be an interesting one stylistically how that pans out. Yep. And again, Paul Hughes against Jordan Vachenik. I like Paul Hughes, but I've got Batman Boy, always. Now, well, of course. So Jordan is one of these people who's everyone says they're the hardest worker in the gym. They do more than anyone else, you know, insert cliches here, but he's one of these who like, I've never seen him tired. I've never seen him gassed. I've never seen him have to sit around that because he's tired. Now that sounds like a very sort of, yeah. So what I've seen him do shark tanks. I've seen him in weight cuts, see him through everything for, I don't know how many years now. And I've never seen him sit around out, ever. If he's not sparring because he's injured or whatever else, that's I don't really count. That's not the same. He's not doing that. But when it comes to him in training, he's there. Of course. He's yeah. never sits around out. We did heel sprints the other day. I was dying. And I'm, you know, almost cried in the car. But, you know, that's between us. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> Rick Savaraja, former Bama title contender, this, that, and the other. With him, he was cracking on with it as well, doing all right. But Jordan, fresh as whatever else, terrifyingly fresh. <laughs> Does these sprints with our strength coach, Adam Hale. I hate and these guys. It's just like <laughs> people, he's getting better to aspire with as well, in the sense of he used to be one of these guys who everyone would be afraid to spar with because he'd go quite hard, this, that, and the other. Because again, it's sort of, you know, pro rounds, this, that, and the other. But now, yeah different people he's getting a, he's finding more of a rhythm to sort of flow with some people and put the pressure on other people stylistically the way he's taking advice from his coaches again the levels the levels the levels this yeah. i've heard of looking forward to that as well um yeah. jack grant against i'm not sure who Ag- aji sadari is again i'm not sure who this who is to be not to be disrespectful i'm not familiar with him but jack yeah. grant again he's been an absolute tear and the last title fight you had was against jai herbert which he ended up getting quite a lot of damage and, you know, didn't go his way. But as to say, it's good to see him back in that conversation. Yeah, definitely. Now, this annoys me. So this is the vacant featherweight title fight. It's not vacant. It's Morgan Charrier's. He won it off Dean Truman and then the events got cancelled prior to that post that because of injuries are set and the other, but now it's now vacant, even though it's not. <laughs> Still, well, um, has, he, has he moved on? Has he gone somewhere else, maybe? Bellator or something like that that we don't know about? Not that I've seen, but there he is about to fight Perry Goodwin. Now, Perry mm-hmm. Goodwin's another one. He's a northern boy. He's from Sunderland. He's had all these fights. He had a fight with Steve Amel back in, before first lockdown, back in March. And he won the decision. Now, I gave it to Steve that fight, but either way, Perry looked good. He looked in shape. And it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one seeing him getting this recognition. Because he's had a, mm. I think he's ten and seven. I think we found it last time, or eleven and seven, or something. Okay. 
So he's he's been in there. He's taken these shots. He's taken these big guys. So if he can weather the storm of Sharia, it'd be an interesting one to see where it goes. And he's yeah. one of these guys. You'd love to see him do well. Now, before we let the people get on with their days, is there anything you'd like to, I don't know, go into any topics you want to go into? Um, not not much really. Uh, I just want to mention that Battle Arena are back. So the amateur show in the UK is going to be, you know, back hopefully in the new year. You know, they are playing a show in March that I'm sure you're aware of. Are you, are you not? Oh, I believe I am quite familiar with this in the instance yeah. that I think I... Oh, I'm on that card. <laughs> You're on that card, of course. But uh, yeah, I just want to give a bit of a shout out to Battle Arena, James Price. You know, he, he's, he's held off and held off and held off from doing like a, you know, these what they call the virtual shows where it's just, you know, the team and, and everybody's watching it on TV at home and stuff. He wants that crowd atmosphere. Um, you know, Battle Arena, they, they're an absolutely amazing platform for amateur fighters. You know, I, I personally, I am a little bit biased because I, I personally are part of the team, you know, was part of the team, are part of the team before my travels. And, um, you know, so I used to work with them. So I am a little bit biased, but, you know, they are, they are ran, you know, they're an amateur show. Uh, they are getting one or two pros on there now, um, but generally they are an amateur show, um, but it is ran like a professional show. So everything you have at a professional show, they have it. They have one of the best referees in the UK. Um, they, they have... Um, they have cut men for every corner. They have hand wrapping. They have and cut women. Have every... You are and cut women. Thank you very much. And cut, sorry, cut women, cut women, cut men, cut women. So cut, cut people, cut um, persons, cut persons um, hand wrap persons. Um, let's be politically correct about it. But no, yeah, they are, they're an amazing amateur amateur level um, show or am, amateur show at a professional level. Should I say? Um, like I say, they are they're doing one of the professional fights. Our friend um, Jeff Agendo is making his pro debut on the same show as you as well. Um, and I know there's one or two other lads from Nottingham MMA planning on fighting. I'm sure there's a few lads from your gym as well, isn't there? I think it's about ten of us. But yeah, this is the thing. So when it comes yeah. to shows in the UK and amateur hey. shows in general, hey, now, the, now the term um, amateur yeah. show again, Carson point out there, they have amateur fights, but they're not an amateur show. It's very professional production. And again, I've been to shows from them for years now. And to see the evolution, but to always see the quality. Now, the quality doesn't have to be you're in a big UFC sort of, you know, Wembley sort of arena. No. Whatever the venue you're at, the cage is well lit, well presented. Everything is space for everything. And again, it's a very, it's a good experience for everyone involved. And to, to give you a bit of context, my fight prior to my last one, I was knocked out in like the first round and afterwards again, everyone, the whole process afterwards, everyone was really respectful and really helpful. James self shook my hands like, you know what, this is short you get caught with. And again, everyone was encouraging. I wanted I got back straight away and the next card got a win. But as to say, the whole process, even on both ends of it, because it's all well and good saying, Oh look, I got my <laughs> my moment, it's all well and good. When it doesn't work out, they're still kind, respectful people. It's not those sort of organizations where it's like okay you got your ticket sale money now fuck off no that they they're people orientated as much as you have to be business orientated in the sense okay i need to make sure we're f- making yep. a profit on the show we can't make a loss they are still looking out for people and their well-being and their health they're not skipping corners like the james has made quite clear on social media outside of the experience side of things he wants to make sure fighters have a fight and the, the staff have a show to go to if you have the reason I'm saying that is because if he shows pull through because they can't yeah. do government restrictions, he doesn't want these people being put out outside of his own cost and his own well being. He doesn't want these people, much like yourself or me being a fighter, to train for nothing. And that kind of like, I don't know, that general awareness of everyone involved that speaks volumes, absolute volumes. Yeah. Now, before we let the people go, well, shout out to our sponsors with English Hypnotist. So again, the English Hypnotist isn't specifically fight orientated, but again, anything where you want to step up your mental game, whether it's in the office, in the cage, in the gym, wherever it is, is definitely worth a conversation. See where you can take the next step. Rico Clothing, a variety of gear. They're always expanding their range. We've got some exciting things in the future. It's looking really promising. And again, Chow himself, the People's IT, and indirectly the Vegan Pizza Company. Because again, you know, 
Got to hook him up. Got to shout out the boy. Shout out the guys That's- supporting us. And most importantly, Carsten, what am I going to say that's next? What? What's oh, the, the new shorts. The new shorts have arrived. Yeah. So we've got medium, we've got yeah. large, and all the short, smalls on the way. I might have got blood in the mine the other day in sparring. So they've worn, they've washed out, so they're battle tested. They are good, they hold up. I love it. Oh, I can't wait to get a hold of mine. Love it. Absolutely love it. Carsten, your <laughs> social media, talk to me. Social media is Carson M. Langeois on Facebook and Carson Langeois on Instagram. Thank you for your time, my friend. And always, everyone, any questions, any topics, fisticuffs underscore podcast to place any orders on new shorts. Again, fire them there. Thank you all for your support and take care and stay safe.